Scientific racism is a pseudo-scientific belief that empirical evidence exists to support or justify racism or racial discrimination, racial inferiority, or racial superiority. Historically, scientific racism received credence throughout the scientific community, but it's no longer considered scientific. One of the earliest examples and really a landmark event in the history of scientific racism comes from a Swedish biologist by the name of Carl Linnaeus, who is writing in the 18th century. And in 1735, he publishes the first edition of, uh, it's translated from Latin, but basically the nature, uh, systems of nature. In this, he gives us what we now know as modern taxonomy, which is genus, species, kingdom, phylum, family, etc. And uh, some of those get added later on. Uh, but it should be no surprise that he actually categorizes human beings much the same way that he categorizes other am- uh, animals and uh, the plant world as well. And so those categorizations are the root of scientific racism in the 17th century. So... What Linnaeus had done is break people or break human beings down into four distinct categories, and he used both physiological and behavioral traits that he, quote-unquote, observed uh, or other people had observed in his records that he was able to read, and these are where he came up with these categorizations. The first categorization that we are going to focus on is uh, Homo sapien Americanus, or for Linnaeus, in a couple of the first copies of system uh, natural systems, he used the word diurnus, meaning like basically awake in the daytime. But regardless, we'll just use Homo sapiens since uh, most of you are going to be more familiar with that. So Homo sapien Americanus, he described them as red, with black hair and scanty beards. They were obstinate, they were free, they're painted with fine red lines, and they're regulated by custom. That's one definition. There are a couple other adjectives that Linnaeus used in other translations from the Swedish to the English. He also adds in red, again, upright, choleric, meaning like angry, uh, and humor dominates their personality. Regardless, every one of these descriptors that Linnaeus uses for Native American or Homo sapien Americanus is meant to uh, essentially denigrate them as less than, uh, especially the part where they are obstinate and free, free as in uh, not governed by anything but custom, which makes them in certain ways inferior to his more celebrated uh, hierarchy of the other races that we'll be talking about. The next one that Linnaeus talks about is Homo sapien Asiaticus, and he describes them as such, yellow, melancholy, with black hair and brown eyes. They are severe, they are haughty, they are stingy, they wear loose clothing, and they are governed by opinion. Other uh, descriptors in different translations also have their humor that dominates their personality. Another key point that we must uh, emphasize here is that stingy is used to describe Homo sapien Asiaticus, i.e. people from Asia. And it's interesting that the historical context plays a crucial role here. Essentially, Europe, of all of its, uh, all of the places around the world that it was still struggling to fully colonize in the 18th century, Asia was one of the last places that they were really able to sink their teeth into. So naturally, that must mean that these people of Asian descent must somehow be stingy. They're not willingly giving all of their resources and labor to the great, uh, European race. So that's interesting that he would use this word stingy. And of course, they're governed by opinion, which is not nearly as good as what we're going to talk about when he uh, digs into Homo sapien Europius. So that's Asiaticus. Homo sapien Africanus. This would probably be the lowest uh, for Carl Linnaeus on his tiers, which clearly justifies systems of enslavement. It's arguably the most racist description we have thus far. He describes Homo sapien Africanus as black, cunning, phlegmatic, meaning that almost kind of like lazy. They have black curly hair. The women act without shame and lactate profusely. What a weird observation, but we're going to keep going. He also said they are anointed with grease and they are ruled by impulse. Uh, Also, he mentions that they are too relaxed. At any point, the one that I really want to focus on 
um, is the fact that they are ruled by impulse, which is more or less like a justification for a need for control, which again, we're, we're right, we're talking about the seven, 1735 for his publication. This is at the peak of the transatlantic slave trade. So this is clearly rationalizing uh, the context in which this man's writing, and it is anything but uh, empirical evidence. This is not scientific by any stretch of the imagination. I also want to just state that Carl Linnaeus had never actually physically seen any of these people other than Europeans. So that's important to note. He moves on to discuss Homo sapien Europius, and we already know where this very white, very Swedish man is going to go with this. They are going to be the basically the the the, the peak of Homo sapiens. Homo sapien Europius are white. They have long flowing hair. They have blue eyes. They are sanguine. They are muscular. They are inventive. And they are covered with tight clothing. And unlike all of the others, they are governed by law, which, of course, during the Enlightenment era, which is when he is writing, was something that was highly celebrated from J.J. Rousseau's social contract theory to the work of Locke and Smith and etc. So... Europius is basically the standard bearer for all other Homo sapiens in Carl Linnaeus's quote unquote scientific explanation. And again, he's combining both physiological and behavioral generalizations that are wildly incorrect, but it justifies the horrific things that Europeans are doing around the world in 1735. Ethnic cleansing of Native Americans, enslavement of Africans, ethnic cleansing of uh, other groups that, or at least attempted ethnic cleansing of other groups in Southeast East Asia, although that wasn't working out quite yet. It's because they're so damn stingy, apparently, under Carl Linnaeus. Um, they hadn't quite made it all the way into Australia and New Zealand, but that's about to come. So what we see here when we are basing things off of assumptions within our historical context and not actual empirical evidence, as Nick has asserted, Carl Linnaeus never studied these people specifically. What we're doing is we're not actually performing experiments. We are rationalizing the society where we live and the privilege that comes from it. Yeah, I think that's a key point. I was reading, researching a ton of the discourse in the scientific and sociological and psychological community about this specific topic. And most of them agree that Linnaeus himself wasn't like a racist or even a white supremacist, that by far this is very Eurocentric. Uh, but the point is that this then became used to justify so many atrocities that we have to look at its consequences, uh, probably weighted more than even its intent, which Linnaeus probably didn't do this intentionally because he was a racist and wanted these things to happen. But that's what ends up happening is that his work, which becomes like part of scientific dogma, really gets used to justify all of these atrocities. And to further uh, delineate and emphasize why this is so important, this was taught as actual science for, in some places, up through the 20th century. So the architects of the United States or the leadership in Europe, they would be reading this as fact. This is what they're learning in their science classes if public school were a thing back then this is what they would actually be learning and this is how you manufacture racist ideology at least one way there are other ways uh, that we'll be talking about uh, pretty soon anyway we always like to mention where you can find these things and if you don't if you're not able to actually find a good copy of system Naturae or natural systems uh, and want to translate it from Swedish to English it's actually uh, Latin excuse me Latin numerous textbooks uh, have this available. One of the ones that we are using is called The Concept of Race in Natural and Social Science. It is edited uh, by Nathaniel Gates and was published in 1997. Another one that we're using is the Encyclopedia of Evolution, uh, written by Stanley A. Rice, and it was published in 2007.